with excitement, allow me to introduce to you today's guest, chef, owner of Chubby Fish, James London. Chef, are you feeling unstoppable today? Yes, I am. Dude, I'm psyched for today's conversation. Uh, I, I love what you're doing with your concept, Chubby Fish, putting focus on sustainability, trash fish. I think it's amazing what you guys are doing. I wish more people would do stuff like this. I can't wait to get into your story, but let's get that motivational, inspirational ball rolling with a success quarter mantra. What do you got for us? So the way that we kind of work here is uh, we say be like water. Mm. And I got that from a chef I worked for a long time ago, Josh, De- Josh DeShellis up in New York. And when we were looking at the at the proposed menu for a restaurant I was doing with him, uh, he said, you know, when you see this menu, just be like water. What does that mean to you? It means we're constantly evolving it. We're constantly moving forward. We're kind of rolling with the punches. So, you know, if we if we ordered something and something else shows up, it's totally fine. Yeah. You know, we just we just adapt and evolve with it. Who and was the chef that said this to you? Josh DeShellis. Was he um, a Bruce Lee fan? <laughs> um, he was he was he was very much inspired by Japanese cuisine, and uh, so he had been the CDC at Union Pacific okay. under Rocco for a while and had been CDC for Boulay for a while and so was very uh, grounded in Japanese technique and Japanese influence when it came to his food and when I moved up to New York I really wanted to pick up that Japanese influence mm. and I love Japanese culture I do too I would love to study it deeper especially around hospitality I love their they're like anticipating the needs of the guest Absolutely. mentality. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's that's one thing we we really put into play here is, you know, we don't really use recipes. We don't um, we don't rely on on a big seafood company to bring us all of our stuff, and we're not ordering, you know, necessarily forty five pounds of red snapper. You know, we working with local independent guys and they're kind of bringing us whatever they have and that's how our menu is influenced every single night so every day is a new day and water conforms to whatever shape it falls into and the day is the shape and the water is what you're doing to accommodate what that day has in store for you basically so conforming to it's a chaos it's being able to pivot in the moment is what i think of when when you think of water you know right And, and enjoying that enjoying that yeah. that controlled chaos yeah and really using it as a as a tool almost to push our food forward and constantly adapt and constantly evolve and never really go backwards being a seafood restaurant that's a really great great way to get today's conversation started with water Absolutely. i love it i don't know if that was intentional or not it wasn't but i really love it <laughs> great awesome where does it make sense to start sharing your story i know you're you're you grew up in south carolina you spent some time in new york city you spent some time in california but w- like when did you know that this was going to be your path like let's go let's go to that point where you're like this is what i want to do so you know i started off in restaurants when i was very young um dishwashing and i was you know, 15 or 16 years old up in Clemson, South Carolina. Um, and it was something I never really took seriously. I came down here. Um, I was playing music at the time, uh, but came down to Charleston for College of Charleston. And, you know, so I was I was cooking. I was playing music and was kind of at a standstill as to, you know, every night I would leave the kitchen at 10 o'clock and I would run to my gig and I'd jump up on stage and I'd, I'd get behind my drum kit and start playing. Nice. But, you know, other people were cleaning up my station at the end of the night and other people were setting up my drums and doing sound check for me. And so it just wasn't sustainable yeah. uh, going forward. And so I had a chef who sat me down and said, tomorrow when you come in, you're going to tell me whether you're going to be a drummer or a chef. And it was it was at that point that night that I really made that call, and I never really looked back on music. I why'd you, Why'd you choose the path you're on now? There was more for me to learn, honestly. With with drums, it was something that was very inherent. It was inside of me. I could I didn't have to practice. I didn't have to. Um, 
you know, uh, study at night. I could just literally get up behind that drum kit and just start going. I could play jazz. Yeah. And with with food. Um, I feel like jazz is chaos. You love the chaos, don't I you? I do. Yeah, I do. And it's very that's very much the way that I cook. It's it's improv. Yeah. And I really love that that side of the artistry of food. Um, and uh, so it was it was very much the same thing in that, you know, food was improv and it was layering and it was um, really just building up and um, and I really got that out of food and I realized that there was more for me to learn when it came to food and so that's really the whole reason that I went down that path is because I just wanted to learn. I wanted to learn how they built those flavors. And How old were you at this point? I was all of 20 years old. 20 years old? You were in Clemson, South Carolina? No, I was down here at oh. College of Charleston. Carl's, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Um, so did you start, when you, when you made this decision to get on the path of being a chef, did you start living differently? Did you start seeing the world differently? Were you, were you more intentional with, with what you were doing? Um, when it came to my career, yes, I didn't change outside of that. You know, I, I still saw the world the exact same as, as, you know, as an artist almost. Yeah. Where my eyes were open all the time. I was always looking for sources of inspiration. So, um, so go ahead. But, you know, cooking, uh, came very easily and naturally to me because I thought of cooking in the same way that I thought of music. I thought about the way that it hit me uh, in my head and in my body when I'm when I'm tasting a sauce, and so it was. Uh, I feel like a, a pretty easy transition uh, to jump into cooking. Nice. Um, do me a quick favor. Tilt that mic up a little bit, and and pull it closer to you. Yeah. Pivot like this. There you go. Now talk. Hello. Oh yeah, I think yeah. we got you a little better. Yeah, beautiful. Cool. Thank you. So, I never had a good singing voice. So <laughs> they never put the mic in front of me. You got a great voice, man. I love it. So, w what happened next for you? Like, when, when, when did you start thinking to yourself, like, I got to start building a career. I got to start being intentional with my time. Did that, did that ever happen for you? Um, I don't, th I don't think that. Uh, I wasn't like hard pressed to like really push ahead. Ultimately, that happened for me. Um, but at the beginning, I was just kind of taking it all in and, and really loving it and really enjoying it. Yeah, you went to culinary school. Was that somebody? Did somebody advise you to do that, or was that by choice? That was by choice. It okay. was purely by choice. It basically what had happened was, I went to college at Charleston. Both my parents were uh, up at Clemson University. And so getting a four-year degree was very important for them. And so, you know, I went down that road and got my degree while I was cooking through school. And, um, you know, at that point, you know, from the time I was, I was 20 or 21, I knew I'm going to open up a restaurant. And I really want to open up a restaurant in Charleston. Okay. And so... What is this like? Two thousand five, six, seven? Where no, are you? This like? is, this is, yeah, this is two thousand five, yeah. two thousand two thousand four. I graduated in 07 from College of Charleston. Got it. So you you, you head to New York in two thousand five. I want to say that's what I have in front of me at least. You're there for eight years, right? Um, you went to the front the French Culinary Institute. Like, did you evolve as a chef here? Would you say? I, I'm I'm curious on what your take is on the the whole culinary school if you would do it all over again do you think you would have gone that path absolutely yeah why so i had i had already been through four years of college i knew how to take notes i knew yeah. how to study and i knew my way around in kitchen but there was things outside of my station that i wanted to learn mm. um so i wanted to know how to make charcuterie and i wanted to know how to make ice cream and i had to pick that up on any of my stations and i wanted to really like fast track it got it got it and was that a two-year program no that was a six-month program. six-month program cool so it was it was incredible it was 
six months, we would get to school, I think, at like 8 o'clock in the morning, and we'd be there until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And then you'd have a demo three or four days a week uh, after school where some incredible chef would come in, and they'd teach for an hour up there. And then you go off to where whatever your internship was, um, whatever kitchen you were stodging in. And so I was able to just, like, get so much information out of culinary school. I came in with a full moleskin of notes, and I wanted them answered. And they were nice. really willing to uh, to open up every yeah. door for me. And I think that's the, the, the magic in culinary school. I don't know if you meant by opening up the doors into the information, but I think opening up networks. But I think the most value, and most young people don't think like this. They just want to go get the experience. They think they're there to learn. I think when you go to culinary school, you're there to make an impression on those professors so that they open up doors for you. And if you if you can make those impressions and you, they like you, you can get anywhere. You can go anywhere straight out of college. Um, did that happen for you? Um, it did. Um, I also think it's good that you waited until after you graduated to go to culinary school because I feel like when you're older – you make way better use of that time. Yeah, you know, for 90, 90% of the people who I went to culinary school with, it probably wasn't the best move for them. Yeah. For me, it was it was exactly what I needed. I needed all those questions answered, and I wanted them answered as fast as possible no. so that I could really shoot down the tunnel and, and go down that path. Yeah. And um, so it was for me, it was extremely, extremely helpful. Um, you know, by the time I was... 26 i had my first executive chef position damn was that at nico's mm -hmm. so you stayed up in new york city for eight years so there must have been something you liked was it a what, like when you graduated school was it, there just opportunities there for you was there a professor steering you in this direction uh there wasn't a professor steering me i basically there was a guy that had been to culinary school with that had taken a line cook position uh with josh josh Deschelles at la fana del sol so i jumped over with him and you know started working the meat station and at that point i had no business being on a meat station in midtown manhattan um <laughs> just on getting, the grill yep getting crushed um but it it beat me up and it tore me down and built me back up all at the same time and it was amazing for me um and from there it was kind of I was I was on my journey, but I, I needed that, you know, coming up, I was always on the cold side. I was always the garmage because mm -hmm. I was so meticulous and I was so detailed and I really loved it. And it's, it's still to this day, it's my favorite station just because um, you're more in tune with the flavors over there. And um, it's more, uh, you know, meticulous and detailed. And I love that that aspect of it. Yeah. Um, so I really wanted to get that that boot camp on the hotline, and, and he really gave it to me. Yeah, so you said it was uh, Nico's was your first executive uh, chef role. You were 26 years old, mm -hmm. right? That's awesome. Um, where do you think you grew the most? I mean, I, I see that at Nico's, you were the first executive chef role. From there, you were at the hotel on the uh, River uh, Rivington, uh, and then you found yourself in California for four years at the Elite Cafe, right? Right. Um, is there anything I'm missing? Any elements that you think need to be a part of your story? Um, no, I mean, you know, there's there's always the times between restaurants where, you know, you're stashing in kitchens and uh, waiting for that place to open up so so you can get paid. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, no, I mean, you know, I, w I was up at the Crow's Nest in Montauk. Um, and just was this before or after? Where, where was this in your timeline? That was between Nico and Hotel in Rivington. Got it. So, what was it about uh, re sorry Nico Restaurant that really said this said to you or made you think this was your path? This is what you have to do. Well, I'd, at that point, I already knew this was my path. Um, well, as far as that restaurant specifically, wh wh why this restaurant? So, this restaurant, this was something Josh Deschelles was involved in. Got he, it. he 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 essentially gave me that position got it um it was a very high-end japanese restaurant we had an amazing uh sushi chef uh who was the number two at sushi asuda wow 
And so I was re- responsible for the back of the house, uh, mainly the hot food, and Hero really took care of the sushi side of things. So it was an opportunity to cook Japanese food, which is the whole reason I really went up to New York in the first place, is because I wanted to put that underneath my belt. And so it was a great opportunity to learn from Josh, specifically Japanese food, um, because he he was uh, a consultant in the restaurant, and so really kind of gave me my foundation and then just kind of let me run with it. What did you learn about leadership in this role? Because this is your first leadership role, really, right? Yes. Um, so I guess Nico really taught me um, – Uh, let's see. Put you on the spot here, aren't I? Yeah, you did. <laughs> um, Where do you think you grew the most as a leader? Was it here or someplace else? It was certainly here. Okay. Certainly, certainly, certainly. Here at Chubby Fish. Here at Chubby not, Fish. The, not at uh, Nico. Right. Yeah. Because here I didn't have another owner um, setting the standard for the overall ethos of the restaurant the vision the values right. the culture here here i got here i got to set the culture yeah and well, so it's it's all mine yeah whereas every other restaurant that i've been the chef at you're i was having to adhere to yeah. someone else's culture you're, you're a water be it positive <laughs> or be it negative yeah and so here i got to really let my personality shine and let my idea of how you treat people and how you treat uh your guest and your employees really come to the forefront. All right. We can shelf that then. We'll we'll talk about that philosophy cool. a little bit more. Um, so how long were you at, Nico, before leaving? So we opened up in 2000 and I want to say 2010. And we shut that down in 2012. Okay. So you had a year at Nico, and then you went on to the hotel at Rivington. Were you not there that long? Uh, so... Nico was, I think, two years. Oh, so two years, two years. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, why'd you guys shut it down? Um, it was there was a contractor at the beginning that was taking money or something like that. Oh. It was it was a real bundle of bundle of rubber bands that eventually just popped. A bundle of rubber bands that popped. Is that an acronym or like a, a, a what's the word I'm looking for? I think of rubber bands and money. But <laughs> no, no, this, yeah, this was the opposite. This okay, was, so there was no this money. Was just all this tension that just eventually just like unwound itself. Was it between part? Like, are you? Yeah, able was, to talk there, about that. Y- yeah, I think there was some partner drama. Okay, um, so and this is the stuff that I like to talk about because this right. is the stuff that buries restaurants. This is the stuff that people are like, oh, like I'll just go open a restaurant and like I'll find a couple people and we'll 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 figure it out from the outside looking in. What was wrong with that partnership? You know, I think it was a bunch of people who had some money to to drop and they were they were passionate about food and you had some people who were who really wanted um a top tier sushi restaurant yeah and they wanted to put their money behind that and build this top tier sushi restaurant and then you had some people who wanted to throw a big party and so the two clashed yeah you know you had one half of the ownership group who were saying, you know, the people want creamy, spicy white sauce. Give them the creamy, spicy white sauce. And you had one half of the ownership there like, no, this is a hardcore sushi restaurant. Hero doesn't want to do the spicy mayo. Don't make them do the spicy mayo. And it was just a constant clash. Um, and some people wanted it to be a late night spot. And some people were like, no, this is not what we're doing. And it just it just eventually fell apart. So the underlying lesson here, if you could summarize it, what would it be? Make sure you really vet your partners. Yeah. And know that you guys have a full fleshed out concept from the get go that you can all agree on. Yes. And know shared that that's vision. the best way forward. Yep. Shared vision. I would also throw on their like lanes, knowing who is responsible for what decisions and staying in your, in your lane, right? Absolutely. Uh, and like this stuff isn't. I mean, even if you know this stuff, it can creep up on you, you know, because we're human. Like, 
but just really like in a committing it to writing like this is who we are this is what we do this is these are our values and not just going and like making sure everyone's signed up for the same thing right uh so you, you, you close that down after two years you find yourself at the hotel rivington um you were there for a couple years too right yes so any points of evolution for you here um, well, when I came in to the hotel in Rivington, that was, uh, supposed to be, you know, uh, a revamp of the hotel restaurant that had been there. And, you know, one thing led to another and the owner wanted to go down a different road with the concept and really kind of simplified and played towards the nightlife because he saw how much n- nightlife revenue was coming in. So it became less and less about the restaurant, and I knew that was probably my curtain call, and I needed yeah. to head out. <laughs> so um, why did you find yourself in California? What, what was going on internally? What was the narrative in your head steering the ship? Honestly, I was I was burnt out mm. at that point. I was. You mean New York City can can do that? It really did. <laughs> um, New York was something that when I came to New York, I was anticipating being there for a year and a half or so, and then jump into a next spot. The thing with New York is it really sucks you in. And I just had all these different opportunities that came up. Um, And next thing you know, I wake up one day in February. Eight years later. (laughs) Yeah, and I'm like, what am I doing here? And um, nothing against the city. You know, I, I absolutely adore that city. It was the best place for me to be at that point in my life and it it beat me up and uh really molded me into who i am today but i was i was ready to go and so uh my girlfriend at the time now my wife um was like well why don't we go out to the west coast and so we went out to the west coast did san francisco and um knew that was going to be kind of a, a stop before we came back to Charleston. So why, so j- just, you said you were burnt out. Did you feel like San Francisco would be a slower pace for you? Absolutely. Uh, was that the case? Uh, yes, it was. So how, well, like, what was the difference? Like paint the, like, the difference and how was it just, was it the restaurant you chose to go to that had a better culture that was more balanced or is it just San Francisco, just generally speaking, more relaxed? I think it's both. Um, I knew at that point that I wanted something that was a little bit more laid back. In New York, I had been pulling 90-hour weeks. And, you know, when I was at Nico, I'd sleep on the banquettes just so I could be there at 7 a.m. to start working. And, you know, I just knew it wasn't sustainable. And I only had so long before, you know, I was going to have a nervous breakdown. Yeah. And so when I started talking to uh, headhunters, I basically said, you know, I want something that is kind of low lift. I want something to get my feet back underneath me. And so they put me up at a place called the Elite Cafe that had been there since, I think, 1981. And um, it was a place where I had two days off. And... I could go explore wine country, and yep. it was just, it was paradise. Mm-hmm. I could get up on Highway 1 and just and just go, and we had an absolute blast uh, being out there. You were there for four years, so mm-hmm. you knew the goal was to come back to Charleston. The goal for you, was it always to open your own place? Was that always the goal? Yeah, ever since I had made that decision early on um, and gave up on music, you know, I really uh, knew I wanted to open up my own place at some point. So this being in the back of your mind as a filter and how you saw the world, like my intention is to go open my own place. I'm going to go get this experience. What were you trying to learn? What was your objective as uh, an executive chef with the intention to open your own place? How are you living intentionally? So I really wanted to flesh out what my concept was going to be for my own restaurant. I really wanted to get a grasp of what that was, what my food was, I also wanted to really simplify my food. In New York, I felt like it was a lot of it was 
how do we turn this carrot into something cool and something um, fun and different. Unexpected, yeah. Right? Yeah. And in California, it was very much, but this is a carrot, let's and it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, and, let it be a carrot. <laughs> right, and let's hit it with olive oil and salt. Yeah. And, you know, a splash of lemon. And I really got a lot out of that experience. Um, I really got a ton out of it just simplifying my food um and creativity became so much easier uh after being in california because it was it was less about manipulating the ingredients and more about um really just the sourcing of ingredients it became so much easier so when you say creativity in what regard in in the sourcing or the pro- the production of uh the production of okay so how does how does really dive into how it became more simple or so you said more creative you create the simplicity opened the door for creativity dive into that sure um so yeah i mean it just it just comes so naturally and you know maybe that's maybe that's going to california and maybe that's growing as a cook but between the two of them all of a sudden cooking became so easy and just like second nature and we could really you know there could be a table of ingredients here in front of us and you know i could i can pick out 10 dishes out of it just like so was the abundance of ingredients that made it more no it was it was that i wasn't focused on manipulating the food i was focused on just letting it lie as simply as possible okay it almost feels counterintuitive but i like i feel like when you're trying to manipulate it like and and it can be anything i feel like there's like no there's like no limit uh, as to what you can do but when you're starting with the product and it is already amazing you're just letting it do its own thing like how does that tie to creativity i guess is where i'm disconnecting so when it, when I say simple food, um, know that my my food is not simple. Got it. It's very my flavors are extremely complex. Um, but instead of using, say, molecular gastronomy yeah. or hydrocolloids, so on and so forth to manipulate a dish or or foam a dish or what have you yeah now i felt like i didn't have to do that anymore Got i it. felt like it, i could um the pressure was off you could just do f- let food be food exactly got it got it got it so you were you were at the elite cafe for four years um knowing when you came back 2017 i think you got there around 2013 I kind of reverse engineered things. I think mm-hmm. you said you were there for four years. Uh, you came to Charleston. You, you opened uh, Chubby Fish in 2017. 2018. 2018. Thank you. Um, wh- what was going through your mind as far as like I need to? I'm gonna open my own place. Like, what do I don't know, and what do I need to figure out in this next four years to be successful with my own restaurant? Was that a narrative going on in your head? Were you preparing to open your own place? Yeah, I mean, at that point. My biggest, my biggest concern was, how do I finance this? You know, the, the, I wasn't concerned so much with the food. Um, I wasn't concerned so much with the service. I was really thinking, God, I have no money. <laughs> and how do I open up a restaurant? Did your time in California help you figure that out? Um, you know, I went to business school and was told create a business plan and then you pitch it off to the banks and you pitch it off to the investors so that's what i was i was rolling in with was hey um i'll create a great business plan and then i'll just pitch it to the banks and then we'll pitch it to investors if we need to so when did you know you were ready to come back east so i started looking at properties in charleston when i was still in san francisco okay and so i Great location, by the way, right here. I love the corner lot. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful spot. Um, It wasn't always this pretty. Uh, You know, the the corner was here, but the building itself was 
dilapidated, falling down. And so it was a real piece of work trying to get this thing up and running. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, so I had the space in mind and knew that this was this was the perfect little corner for it. So you found this while you were still out west. Mm-hmm. Okay. How long, how much time elapsed from when you found the location to when you came here and started making things happen? Or did you make things happen still out there? Uh, I'd still be, you know, I signed a lease, I think the first week I got to Charleston. Um, because I knew this spot, I knew it was, it needed a lot of work, but I just saw the potential in it and knew that this is the spot we wanted. And so I had, I looked at this space every day for about six months, just looking at the ad and yeah. would wake up next to it. Is it still there? Is it great. still available? Um, and so as soon as I got to Charleston, first thing I did was I signed that lease. Yeah. I had no money set up, you know, but I knew this is the spot we wanted. So b- before we leave California and mm-hmm. talk about your journey of opening Chubby Fish, anything that you did in California – Part of your story, um, knowledge gathered, mentors gained, information absorbed, anything before moving away from that part of your life? I mean, certainly uh, learned a lot about wine when we were out there. Yeah. Um, We spent a lot of time up in wine country and uh, really came to appreciate the produce that they had out there just absolutely incredible yeah and really kind of adopted that simple style into my food into my cuisine it sounds like you also found balance out there absolutely yeah and i don't know what your hours were when you opened here yeah it was the first time in my entire career that i had days off yeah you know and you have two days off here too sunday monday Right. Right. You also open at five o'clock every right. day. You close by 10 or 11. That's the California influence. Yeah. So was that from day one or is this post pandemic? I know a lot of people oh, no, that dial was back. One. Okay. No, I, I knew I'd seen the good life, you yeah. know, when I was out in California and knew that ultimately I want to be able to give my cooks that um, some semblance of quote unquote normal life. Yeah. Balance. Right. Right. Time for yourself. Uh, I think that's huge. You know, I think that's one thing that will bury people in this industry from a, like a business perspective. For some reason, people think like I need to be open every day. I need to be, we need to do breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day. That's a recipe for a failure. Like you're gonna burn out. You know, Absolutely. you gotta make time for yourself. And I think that that's a, one of the biggest lessons so far in this, in this, in this episode. So like is around business is just like, find that balance. Don't overcommit because you will burn out and you don't want to, you don't, it's better to accelerate into something than to go fast and then dial back. Yeah. Right? It's a, it's a long haul. Yeah. It's, it's hard hours and it flies by, Yeah, but your body feels it yep. and your brain feels it. We have to interrupt today's video to let you know that right now restaurant systems pro is offering a no strings attached 60 day trial that will help you improve your systems increase your profit and find better work life balance all you have to do is click the link below the year now did you come in 2017 or or did you come here in 2017 and open in 18 or was it 2018 yeah we we came here 2017 open up in 2018 so you signed the lease in 2017 Mm -hmm. what was it like man this 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 building you've been looking at for six months a flyer you're standing in front of it. You signed the lease. It's yours. It was so scary. Yeah. It was so scary. Did you have the money before signing the lease? No. So take us through it. <laughs> um, yeah, they will always tell you not to do that. Yeah. But, you know, I I knew that this was the spot and this was my goal and this was my dream. And Manifest God, that looking shit. back, it – that – certainly could have buried me yeah will it into reality but if you want it you know if you want it uh you just some, sometimes you just gotta go you just gotta start right yeah and, and i felt like happen. i felt like i needed that that pressure in a way as well yeah. i needed that you know it's just like you know i have i have like terrible add I can but, relate. <laughs> but you put me in a kitchen and you open those doors at five o'clock i'm zoned in like yeah. i'm on it i just i just need that little bit of pressure yeah um 
and so that's what that lease gave me. There's it also science gave me a lot of sleepless that. nights. I, I know um, Tim Ferriss in his book, um, what is it, The Two Hour Work Week or something like that, he talks about all these like life hacks, things you can do to be more efficient, to work less. And part of that is giving your like limiting and just starting and like and like limiting the time you have. If if you you need that pressure, but if if you just if if you don't have that pressure, you're never gonna start. But I think what in the book he talks about literally like waiting to the last minute because if there's that pressure that this has to get done then you're 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 forced to be more focused whereas if you have all day if there is no pressure you just put it off right so like sometimes you just got to sign the lease right and and that that changes the situation so you sign the lease you don't have any money um did you put money away working out west were you, were you saving oh no we were spending everything i mean you're living in san francisco right yeah i mean this is a, <laughs> we we my entire new york and san francisco experience was you know was working a lot but Anything we had, any time we had off, you yeah. know, we're spending that that money on food. Did you have the business plan when you came here? Were you yes. working on that? Okay. Yes, had and a business plan. And you, when did you know you wanted to focus on fish? Because that hasn't come come out of the story yet. No, it hasn't. Um, so growing up, uh, you know, my grandparents lived in Charleston. I was born in Charleston. Um, there's a big connection with Charleston and the sea, a mm-hmm. uh, big connection with Charleston and seafood. Uh, the seafood here, I, it's far superior to anywhere else in the entire country. We have this amazing diversity of seafood here that you don't find in other places. Why is that? Is it because like the, so geographically where Charleston's located, we're right smack in the middle of two main fisheries. One is the South Atlantic fishery yeah. and one is the mid Atlantic fishery. And they overlap right at Charleston. Okay. So we basically get double the fun of any other place in the country. You got the uh, the Gulf Current that comes up, mm-hmm. goes kind of wraps around the like the Caribbean, goes up along Florida, right. and then right around Charleston is is that where it kicks out to like like there, it almost like like cycles out to the ocean right here and up. Sometimes it goes up towards like New England. Right. But is yeah, it so we the we get all these amazing pelagic fish that come through Charleston. Um, and it's just a very fertile, uh, really awesome fishery. So you get the best of both parts of the ocean yeah. overlapping, right? It's here. incredible. Even to this day, we still get species that we've never seen before. That's crazy. Even that our fishermen haven't seen before. That's cool. They'll bring us stuff in and they'll be like, I've never seen this one. You want to try it? I wonder <laughs> if that has anything to do with like the, like the ecosystem of the ocean changing with some fish being over over fish and now there's more probably more totally and we're room see, for we're other s- fish to move into seeing, that space yeah we're seeing shifts yeah um we're seeing fish that normally we don't see uh that are coming into our waters filling the void probably right, and we're seeing fish that used to be here in, in prevalence that have now shifted or moved to a different water yeah interesting uh I, I want to be. I would love to talk about sustainability at some point, but I think we're going to put that off towards the okay. what we can do to you know make the the industry a little bit better of a place. But going back to this idea of your business plan, planning, um, going to banks, like how like did you get the money right away? Like how did you sell yourself? How did you sell your vision? So, I would basically go into the banks and give them my pitch and my business plan, and the banker I was sitting in front of would say. That's an amazing idea, and I love it. And what I'm was like, the idea? Pitch, pitch it me like you were pitching sure. me. What do you want to do? So Chubby Fish is a dock-to-table seafood restaurant. We change the menu every day. We, we work with small independent fishermen who um, bring us what they catch, and it's super fresh, and the menu changes every day. It's creative and open kitchen concept. The kitchen is going to be dropping off the dish right to you they'll be clearing and um small fun and casual and the banker would say you know i'll, I'll be there every day and this sounds amazing and we can really get behind something like this yeah and what about the money did you ever talk about the numbers and the amount of revenue you're expecting to pull in and mm-hmm. what you're in absolutely de- so did it all work on paper yes and did, did was it what you thought was is what you thought what happened as far as the plan no it was so much better 
when it actually happened. <laughs> I love that. You it's know, always it, great news when and it they tell you to better. be conservative, and I yeah. was I was very conservative. Um, so but, was it? So it sounds like it was easy for you to get the money then. No, Just, no, no. So they would tell you this sounds like a great plan. Yeah. I'm going to come there, but you're not. What would they say after that? They'd take it up upstairs, and then I would always get a letter of rejection. What was their reason? Um, did they didn't feel comfortable investing in restaurants. So how many banks did you end up going to? 30 something. 30 something. Did you end up getting the money from a bank or from no. friends? Um, so once I had been turned down from pretty much every bank around Charleston, I went to something called the Low Country Development Center, the LDC, and they work here in Charleston and uh, around the low country of South Carolina. And they were able to cut me a loan. Um, and so that's how we were able to get underway. Okay. Uh, so what exactly is this? This was called the low, what's it called? Low Country Development Center. Low Country Development Center. And what do they do? So they offer uh, loans to small businesses that can't get conventional loans. Where do they get their money? Uh, it's a state funded okay. uh, program. Got it. Um, so what 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 was appealing about your concept that they gave you the money? Or are they just really like how did you even find out about this opportunity? So I had been to another organization also run by the state, the Small Business Development Center, and had talked with them and you know, he focused on trying to get my business plan to where he thought it would make sense for the banks and so, you know, I spent a few more months doing that, um, you know, basically I was burning my, you know, burning my wheels, just spinning. Yeah. And, um, so I had heard about this LDC and figured I'd take a stab at them yeah. and it really worked out. Nice. So how much money do you think you're going to need? Cause this is a beautiful space. And you said that when you got, when you, it wasn't always like this, you know, you, you pointed out that the building w was rough. Mm -hmm. Um, how rough was it? Um, Dirt floors, no plumbing, no electricity. There was a drop ceiling, so the tin ceiling wasn't in here. None of these windows were here. It was just two small windows in the front, two small windows on the side, metal door. Um, none of this leaded glass was in here. Um, it was just siding. It's a the lot top of work, of man. Uh, it's a lot. How much money did you think this was going to take? Was it was when you finished getting the restaurant ready after you got your money, was it the way it looks now, what it looked like just after you finished or has it evolved since then? No, this is what it looked like. How much did it cost you? Mind me asking that question? Sure. Um, all in this was almost 800, 800 man. How much did you get a loan for? Um, so we wound up with a loan, I think for almost 600, so you had to come up with an additional two hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. Did you did you think you could do it at six hundred, or did you exceed? Oh yeah, I thought I could do it for like four hundred, <laughs> but I was so naive. You know, I had yeah, no that always happens. I had no experience with construction. And the record, the rule of thumb is whatever you think it's going to take, double it. Right. And guess what? You you thought yeah. you could do it for four hundred, and you ended up needing eight hundred. Yeah. So where where was the the hidden expense? Um. So we had to tap into the main, um, but when we tapped into the when we tried to tap into the main on Cumming Street, they basically said, "Hey, it's too tuberculated." What does that mean? It's too stopped up. Okay. And so we had to rerun the piping out to the other corner. Okay. Um, which meant, you know, tearing up the the, the kitchen floor that oh we'd already gosh. laid down. Ugh. Um, there were just so many, so many hidden expenses right. um, that we had to deal with. So anything that you know now that you would have done differently then to save some money to do things in a different way? I would certainly hire a project manager. Okay. My that's own. A, that's what I was thinking. Not yeah. a contractor's. What would that have done for you? Expedite everything. Um, take the stress off my shoulders yeah and they it also kn they also know things through experience like we got to find out where we're going to tap into the our power source or whatever the, the plumbing was it plumbing electric what was the, the 
from the, the, the we, so that, that was the that was the water oh the water yeah so water like all these sewage. variables like what are the the things that we need to get figure out now for sure because if we start before getting these things figured out then we might have to redo what we already started right those right. little things that we, you would never know that as a, a as a somebody who spent their career in a kitchen right? right and very very heads down in a kitchen exactly you know i'm not i'm not going home and studying construction opening restaurants on my, on my not the same as running restaurants right <laughs> completely different beast um so y- you would have gotten your order of operation a little bit differently you would have figured out the the, the basic stuff uh, that you need to get right because you know later on if you don't get it right it will re- you know cause tr- issues what else um i'm not giving you a hard time because no matter who you are in the restaurant industry like you're gonna make little mistakes but sharing these stories helps us kind of think differently right and i thought i should make sure i don't do that so you that was a big expense for you right the uh, tearing up the floor how much that cost additional i would imagine like we gotta scrap everything that you the work you did 75 yeah so um what were the other hidden expenses um change orders what are change orders? So change orders are essentially when you agree on what the construction is going to be up front. And then every little tiny change or quip along the yep, way tax on. hits a change order. Right. And change orders are thousands and thousands of dollars each time. Yep. And so, you know, each time there's a little change, whether it's a delay on the 4 by 4s that were supposed to be coming in or the the stringers that were supposed to be here um every single time you're you're getting a change order yeah what are what's a one change order run for or go for as far as like approximate like how much is a one like is it a flat rate for each change or did they factor it out on, on average what does it cost yeah you just get a you just get a bill and it's like all right um you wanted the hvac duct over there but because uh, because your menu board runs right there, we have to run the HVAC duct over here. So that's going to be $6,500. Uh, and that starts to add up. How many yep. change orders would you say you, you got? God, they gave us probably 40 change orders. Damn. Yeah. yeah. You can see how these things start to add up real fast, right? Mm-hmm. Project, I think that's one of the biggest lessons I learned is, is stay in your lane um, and – you might want to try to do things as cheaply as possible. And I think that there's something to be said about doing it yourself and being scrappy. But also like if you don't have somebody in your corner who knows what they're doing, that $400,000 project that I can manage becomes an $800,000 pro- $800, project real fast. Uh, Cause you just don't know what you don't know. Right. Right. So spend, and, and, and all, I think it also depends. So spend the six, the $600,000 to hire somebody and everyone you need, you know, spend that $200,000 because that, at least you're getting like that's manageable right but mm-hmm. it, it, i don't know i think i think we're communicating this well like, yeah and, and you're, and you're not experts. you're not having to be on site <laughs> yeah. all the time you know calling your contractors to wonder you know wondering where where all the subs are that day because yeah. there's nobody in the building yeah you can have somebody else doing that for you instead be out there starting to develop the relationships right. with the purveyors you're going to be working with right? totally. like that's your lane right and that was one thing i was curious about like I think that there's like I love restaurants like this, but they're hard. To, they're much more harder to make profitable, right? Because you're you're changing every day. You can't build systems around chaos. Absolutely. I mean, you can, but it's you know it's harder than doing one thing the same. You're not a burger joint, you know. You're mm-hmm. not you're not In and Out Burger. You're not a taco joint that has the same tacos every day. And you build systems around that, and you you put people with no experience into the system you like there's ways to find margins in different business models than what you're doing but i love what you're doing because they're so it's so soulful you know and i love the soul that this industry attracts but it's a challenge so what were those challenges for you trying to do a new menu every day developing all these relationships with different purveyors to keep it fresh like get into that sure uh the biggest thing was was finding the the all my fishermen up front i bet you know because at first we were looking at all the different seafood companies around here and we were saying all right we want to know what boat these fish came off we want to know how they were caught so on and so forth we want to know exactly where they were caught and 
they were all gung ho about that, and they said, "Absolutely, we can tell you that we'll d- put on your invoice." And lo and behold, one week before we open, they all contact me and say, "Hey, yeah, we're not going to do that." Oh, after um, you sign, right? <laughs> it, well, we didn't have to sign okay. anything with with the seafood That's companies, true. but you know, obviously, we're not going to order from them at that point. So, you know, I started going down to, um, going down to the docks essentially and saying, you know. Who can we talk to to get us really good seafood? Yeah. And so that's how we kind of made it shake. We had a, a really amazing relationship with, um, and we still do, with Abundant Seafood. Um, and then we have, you know, some other uh, small people who work with us. So what are the things, if we want to do what you've done, to be a fresh menu every day, to develop relationships with, with the the fishermen, like you said, dock to table, right? What are the challenges? What are the, what's the advice you can give somebody who's trying to recreate what you've done here in different cities? So first thing is weather is always going to play a big factor. So when the waters are really rough and they can't get out and fish, that means we don't get fish. So do you close? What do you do in this? Mm-mm. So we have to engineer our menu in a way that makes it so that even if we didn't receive fish for a couple of days, we can still run. So a lot of that is preserving. So we do um, a very heavy uh, smoking component to our menu. We always have uh, our smoker running, so we're smoking fish that can be cross-utilized in a few different dishes. Whenever we get a ton of fish, so sometimes we'll get like 300 pounds of king mackerel. Right. And how do you how do you work with 300 pounds of king mackerel well you can smoke it yeah and all of a sudden that king mackerel that would be lasting you two to three days is now lasting you three to four weeks got it and so we engineer our menu in a way that we can always when times are good (laughs) yeah yeah but and we stretch out those good times so that when times are rough we still have an ample pantry to pull from um so oysters Unless there's a hurricane, uh, or unless there's a, a a line a sewage line break, you know oyster farms will always be pumping out oysters. So we we have oysters. We can cross utilize oysters in different dishes. Um, you know the smoked fish. We go vegetable heavy, so yeah. we have a we ha- always have a ton of vegetables, um, and then we throw in scatter in a few meat dishes. So the way that we engineer it. Um, it works well, uh, even when the fishing's not good. But that being said, this menu only comes about because of the relationships we have with our purveyors. That's that was wh- my that's, next question. That's why when people when people say, "Hey, why don't why don't you do a chubby fish in Houston, or why don't you do a chubby fish in Washington D.C., um, Savannah, so forth?" Because your relationships aren't there. Exactly. Yeah. This this restaurant is all about relationships. Well, that was my next question: is how do you develop? Like, what is your advice for finding these purveyors, these these fishermen, uh, and establish? Like, what are the what are the benefits of doing that? But I'm sure there's challenges. Like, so f- so first, how do you? What's your advice for establishing that relationship? I think you just got to get out there. You just got to get out there and shake hands and talk to everybody who's doing anything cool and. Uh, talk to them about what they're doing and about what you're doing and figure out how you guys can work together. Yeah. You covered some of the challenges of going direct to source is sometimes the weather is not great. Sometimes the source can't get you what they promised because of things that are out of their control, right? Um, but what are the, some of the other challenges of going direct to source? Is it like organized, like organizationally challenging? Invoicing, stuff like that? No, I mean, the invoicing sucks. Um, I mean, you have how many different purveyors, right? Right, and a lot of these guys, you know, th- they're not, they're not paying through credit card. So yeah. you're having to sort through all your invoices on yeah. top of everything else you're doing. Um, and some of them don't even give you invoices. It's you know, they just say, hey, uh, yeah, here's a hundred hundred dollars, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. And um, s- but you know, I always, I always enjoy, um, kind of the undiscovered yeah. and. Um, the underutilized 
uh, farmers and, and purveyors out there. So those are the people we, we choose to support. You, you also put a lot of emphasis, I think I picked up on this in my research, and maybe, maybe it's not a lot, but I saw something that you, you, you are focused on trash fish too, right? Did that, was that always the case? I know that about two or three years ago, like the, the, the story of, of utilizing like trash, si- trash fish became sexy, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it was it was a happening trend where you know people are going in and utilizing fish that aren't traditionally like eaten. Um, was that never was that part of what you were trying to do from the beginning, or did that come later as the industry started to evolve a little bit? I guess for me, it, it wasn't something that. These were these are fish that I grew up eating. Yeah, I grew up catching them and I grew up eating them. And you know, so stuff like um, sheep's head, uh, you know, oyster toadfish. You know, <laughs> these are things that I would catch, uh, you know, off my uncle's dock yeah. and would bring it inside and and we'd eat it. Yeah. And my mom would cook it up and we'd eat it. Yeah, and um, and they're awesome. They're delicious. I've never had and, it. And my whole philosophy on seafood is it's all incredible. Um, if you know how to cook it. Right. Yeah. You just got to figure out what your technique is. Like mackerel, smoke it. I, mackerel, <laughs> smoke it. We yeah. serve it raw. Really? We serve it in ceviche. Yeah. Um, we lightly poach it. We uh, grill it. We pan sear it. Yeah. We serve the collars. You know, it's all amazing. We will cure the roe and use it uh as a batarga yeah so it's it's all incredible you mm-hmm. just gotta figure out what your technique is yeah with it. yeah as long as it's fresh right uh what was the evolution of chubby fish like like wh- who were you on day like year one versus who you are today i think when when we first opened chubby fish i was trying to go as casual as possible and i still wanted to be casual but when I say oh, I was trying to go as casual as possible, I wanted it to be something where you essentially came in, you got a number uh, when you put your order in, and you went and sat down at your table with your number, and then we bring the food out from the kitchen. Okay. Is that the case now? No. So I'm looking around. It looks like you have the front door. You have tables in the middle of the space. I do see a PO. Is that a, is, do you people order at the counter, or is that just a terminal for your servers? That's just a terminal for the service. Okay, got it. So people, so people walk. When you first opened, people walked in. They went to a counter, got a number. Yeah, so they would walk into this counter here. Yeah. They would order. They would plug in your order. You get your number. Ticket spits out to the kitchen. Um, we make the order in the kitchen, and then we carry it out to your table. Yeah. Why? Why did that change? I think it changed because a we had a line going down the block of people waiting to order <laughs> and we still have a line yeah but now it's people waiting to come in and sit down and so now we've switched over to more of a traditional sit down service model where you check in with the host you put your name down uh for a table later on and then you come back when you're when your table's ready sit down uh, and then traditional server comes over, takes your order. Got it. Um, what was the reason for for changing that in your mind? Was it? Was, what was the benefit of changing it? Um, I think it just made it a little bit more pleasurable for the customer. Got it. Um, so having them stand outside in the sun can get hot out here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Totally. And you know it's. You had to wait in line to get your to place your order. So, so you're taking reservations now, or is it a wait list? It's a wait list. Got it. Are you leveraging technology to to do that or not? We're doing it old school. Okay. Um, so, has that affected your bottom line, or is it just you feel like you're being more hosp- hospitable to your guests? We're being more hospitable. Um, ultimately, I think better service. Better service. Um, we can do a little bit more higher end things. Um, when we have a server, yeah, as opposed to uh, feeling like a fast casual where you know you're, uh, you know, having to pay fifty six bucks for a swordfish schnitzel, yeah, um, 
and so on and so forth. So you were super successful straight out of the gates, right? Mm -hmm. you, you're, you're, you're yeah, there that was picture, a, there was a, a pin up demand. Of, yeah. So what's going on in Charleston? Because you're not the only fish joint in Charleston, right? No. There's lots of options for fish in Charleston. There like are. I said, like this is a unique market for fish. What were you doing differently that you think gave you so much success early on? We were really utilizing purely local fish. Okay. That was that was the big difference. Okay. Um, and Which we is were crazy because you pointed out that it's such a, right. a unique market for fish. You think that people would be leveraging that. Like you go up to New England, you're going to get lobsters and like, you know, what else we s is big up there? Uh, the cod is you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of stuff, flounder and shit like that. But like there's whole industries built around the, the seafood. Like you, you think of like crab cakes in Maryland, you know, like what, was there anything like that down here? Or was there literally no utilization of the local fish? No, there's certainly there's certainly people who are who are and are continuing to do it. Yeah, you know, uh, Mike Lada was uh, who has the ordinary and fig uh, yeah. was certainly a pioneer here in yeah. Charleston um, and was doing that. You know, back in back when I was in New York, got it. And uh, Mark Mahefka with Abundant Seafood was doing that. Um, Cindy Tarvin with Tarvin Seafood was doing that. Um, so what was different with you? Was it because your your focus was on the fish? Yeah, it was it was the entire restaurant was centered around this is our local seafood that we got in today and this is what's gonna be on the plate tonight and it's gonna be in a method that you probably haven't necessarily tasted before. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of people it's weird. Like I feel like humanity hinges on like we evolve. A lot of why we are where we are today is because we have a, a seafood diet, like the high protein diet. Like they say, like that helped us evolve to where we are today, like over thousands of years, right? But people, I feel like today don't eat fish that often, or they're not that familiar with the different ways to eat fish and how. Like, so you, you, you. I think you kind of probably open people's eyes to like this was caught here, right? And there's so much we can do with it. It's not just, you don't just, just have to fry it. You know, there's so many different ways to prepare it. Right. Um, yeah, and that's something that I, I really wanted to steer away from is from fried seafood. Yeah. And that was that was a tough sell at first because people would come in and they'd say, what, you don't have, it's not fried. And because it's such a big part of southern food is is fried seafood right. you know fried whiting fried catfish sounds like you overcame that though absolutely so how um, did you overcome the i guess the expectation from your consumer we had to tell them why we didn't put in the fryer we had to tell them because it's so fresh and sometimes that meant coming out of the kitchen coming out of the walk-in with a fish and being like <laughs> yeah. we didn't want to fry this it's yeah. so beautiful look right. at it right and um and eventually you know People, people got that. Is it hard to make a f seafood, like a, 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 a restaurant that f focuses, I know you do like vegetables too, but your focus is on the protein. Mm -hmm. Is it hard to make that pro that profitable? For me, it's it's not as long as we're utilizing the entire fish. Okay. So how, do you mind talking about sure. your margins? Like, what, like how do you make this, this work as far as profit goes? So essentially, if we get a... A gray tile fish, for yeah. instance, which is not the most common tile fish. The most common you see is golden tile fish. Yeah. With a gray tile fish, it's generally considered bycatch, and so it's it's generally at a cheaper price point. Um, so we a try to use these under light underutilized species because the market really hasn't caught up with the true value yet. Um, so th it's going to be at a cheaper price point. Yep. It's still as delicious. You just got to figure out how to cook it. And you're getting the whole fish. You're not just getting the fillet. Yeah, so we never get it. That never byproduct get is, is potential mark profit, right? Right. So so we'll cut the cheeks out of that fish. We'll cut the collars off that fish. Um, or we'll serve a cross cut of the head. Um, so that I view as all those off cuts right there I view as profit. Got it. They're just cream on top. We take the bellies off. And we'll use the bellies for something. They could be either smoked um, or, uh, you know, we'll turn them into a pate, so on and so forth. Yep. The uh, top and bottom loin we're going to use uh, as 
more of a traditional yeah. cooking method. Um, for us right now, we're using it as a poached um, tile fish dish. And so we poach that in a broth that's made out of that tile fish's bones that we smoke. Yeah. Um, so nothing on that fish went to waste. Yeah. So how do you balance that with labor? Because you, that, it's not easy for anybody to come off the street and be able to do what you're talking nope. about, right? So how do you really squeeze the most profit balancing the the utilization of every piece of that fish, but also with getting skilled, time-consuming work that's in there? Like, how do you find that balance? Um, so, I, I mean, my labor costs are, are through the roof. How many people are in here usually? I see two back there right now. Yeah, so that's that's our two guys who are on our prep team. Um, at nighttime, we have one on garmage, one on oysters, one on saute, one on grill, uh, myself, and a dishwasher. And then we have one extern. Um, but... I pay my cooks extremely, extremely well because they, they're the best in Charleston and they deserve it. Yeah. And they really bend over backwards to get behind what we do here. And uh, at the end of the day, they just really deserve it. They've been yeah. with me for a long time. Um, and, you know, so I pay them well because, A, I think they deserve it. Of course they um, do. But, you know, it means my labor costs are high, which means i got to make up for it in other ways. And so They're earning that paycheck. Right. Yeah. And, um, I mean, this restaurant is 40 seats. We do 160 covers a night. Wow. Um, so we get four solid turns. And, you know, we're able to, to make that shake uh, given the volume that we have. Yeah. What about the pricing when you're menu, menu engineering, mm -hmm. right? Because you, you're doing different menu every night, right? Right. So you, you're not back there weighing out, you know, the I, like, the, yeah, like you can't figure out down to the penny what that costs you, right? So how do you come up with a price? Are you just, do you just work in a good margin there that you, that you, yeah, feel I'm, 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 about? Sh I'm shooting for 27% on, um, on the traditional, uh, things. When I say traditional, I mean like siding a fish and taking portions out of the loins. Okay. And then knowing that I'm gonna sell all the off cuts off of this piece of fish, um, I'm not factoring those into that 27%. Okay. So I know at the end of the day, my food cost is gonna be sub 27%. Okay. Um, I mean, I think too, when you do what you do, and you're the only person in town doing it, and it's your focus, it gives you, I think, the unwritten permission to charge what you think that's worth. Mm -hmm. And if people are still showing up every day, and they're still doing four turns, and like you're, you're squeezing as much volume through this thing as possible, don't be ashamed to charge what you need to charge to, to get whatever like percent profit you're aiming for, right? Just like take that fucking profit if you can. Like, don't right. be, a, do you, do you ever, like, do you ever feel guilty? Do you oh, ever I'm, do, a, like, I'm, I'm too nice. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm real nice. Yeah. So there's um, tons, of, tons of value on the menu. It's <laughs> not that I feel guilty. I just want to, I don't want to be the place that charges the most for their dishes. Yeah. And I know I could. It's because you want the casual vibe? Yeah, I want it to be casual. I want it to be someplace that it's not just a special occasion restaurant. Yeah. I want it to, you know, we when we opened up, this was a neighborhood seafood joint. And I still want it to be a neighborhood. neighborhood so you don't want to be out of reach from the people that are here. Every I don't. Day. Yeah. I don't want to alienate, uh, you know, my neighborhood people. So how do you find that balance of, of making it reach like within reach for most people in the neighborhood? I, I think it's important to point out too, that Charleston probably can, aff the people demographic can probably afford this. Right? Oh yeah. There's not like, there's g a good healthy economy here in Charleston. There's right. plenty of money to be spent. So that probably helps the business as well. But how do you find that balance of, of keeping it within reach, but also making sure that you're taking care of your employees, that you're that you're getting what you deserve? Yeah, I mean, I, it all boils down to sell those offcuts. It really does because yeah. they're they are the profit. They're the profit generators. We so make we make all of our bread off those offcuts. So how does this? translate into training your servers and, and getting people turning them into salespeople really making sure that we make our money off of the offcuts 
Well, I mean, the, the cool thing about here, and it's unique in that I've never worked in another place where people really trust us. Yeah. People walk in that door and they'll see stuff up, up on that menu that they've never had before. Yeah. And they really trust us to prepare it. And they really, if they're going to try it, they want to try it here. Yeah. And I would love a place like this. Yeah. I, I admit, like, I don't really know seafood that well. But just coming in and just knowing that every day is going to be an adventure. And I'm going to try something that I've probably never tried before. And it's right down the street. Sign me up for that, dude. Yeah. No, absolutely. And, and when I set out to create this restaurant, I really wanted a place that I would want to come eat. And um, I th- think we really pulled that off. Yeah. Um, so five years now. Congratulations, man. That's huge. Uh, to, to make it a year is a challenge. To make it five years is even more impressive. What were the biggest challenges for you? You're, like, how, how have you, you mentioned earlier that you grew the most as a leader here. Who were you as a leader when you first started versus who you are now? How have you evolved as a leader? Um, I guess, like I said before, when I was first starting out, it was, I was, uh, I was working for an owner. Yeah. And with that comes their vision, their core values. Right. You're, you're drinking the Kool-Aid. Absolutely. Yeah. And here I got to be, you're making the Kool-Aid. Right. Yeah. Um, so also, you know, every restaurant prior I had to cook in one style of food. And so here, when I got to create my own restaurant, everything just came out yeah. and it, it wasn't, I wasn't pigeonholing myself into one specific cuisine as a leader here. I got to just kind of lay my personality out on the table, my work ethic, um, the way that I cook, the way that I interact with my cooks, with my servers, with my guests, and just kind of let that personality shine and let other people see that and adopt that mm. so when you're trying to com- like, did you commit the culture to paper or is it just is it experienced through you and absorbed through you and echoed through you do you do you vibrate through your staff basically because of your presence and the culture that you inherently just bring into this place every day or do you really try to commit it to writing and like train people up to, to be a part of your culture we certainly have a handbook, yeah. But I, there's, I, in my experience, there's only so much you can convey through yeah. through a piece of paper. What you do every day speaks louder than what you say you are. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. So, how was that evolution as a as, as a leader? Like, um, has it? You said you grew as a leader, but how did you cha- how did you grow as a leader? Um, or were you always always a good leader? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, I've, I've been a chef for a long time. Um, and, you know, like I said, uh, working for other people, yeah. you're, you're, you're ultimately, um, they shine, you know, through you. Yeah. And here it, it was just me. And yeah. people, you know, I've always been an extremely hard worker. Um, always always tried to be the first person in and the last person to leave. Got it. And so I think over time we've kind of created this, um, or not created, but developed this crew who really sees that and really understands, um, how passionate we all are. When you're doing special work, man, when you make, when you really go out of your way to, to, to go through the obstacle, to, to do things the hard way, I think there's just a certain level of like just pride associated with that. And the work you do speaks for you, you know, like culture isn't what you say you are. It's the things you do every day, right? It's how you show up every day and the actions you go through the resistance you choose to take on head head on, right? That is your culture. That is, that's the reality of it. So when you're doing good work, you have good culture. You attract onto those people yourself, those people who share your values, who, who want to do work that you're doing. You know, you, you naturally attract onto yourself those badasses. Yeah. You're shaking your head. Yes. Is that what, I mean, am I interpreting no, I, that? No, well? absolutely. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. yeah. Um, so what were your biggest challenges in five years of ownership? First time owner, what are the things that were hard for you? What were the things that you weren't expecting as a, as a restaurant owner? 
Um, you know, outside of the construction stuff, I I feel like I had a pretty good grasp of what it all entailed, and it was essentially what I was doing before as a yeah. chef. You know, the only thing was you now it. instead of <laughs> instead of relying yeah. on someone else to get something done and having to badger them over and over again yeah. to get it done, now I could just do it myself. Got it. And so it was. You know, I I feel like I had a I had a good grasp of yeah. what I was getting into. Yeah. Has has the market evolved um, since you opened this? Is it different now than it when, it, when it was in 2018? It's it's certainly gotten busier. Yeah, I think just good. because we've gotten um, good word of mouth out there. But you know, I think in general, Charleston has gotten busier. Yeah, uh, we've certainly had a lot of people the, move here. The pandemic helped a lot of e- uh, economies. Uh, if Absolutely. you weren't a big city. But you were a city, an a, mod, a modest sized city with a room. Um, people were looking to get out of the skyscrapers, but they still wanted to be in a like in a city that wasn't huge. like Charleston, Nashville, Austin, like all these moderate sized cities became bigger like overnight. Yeah, it really yeah. did. Yeah, and you know, still to this day, there's just so many people flocking here. There's an amazing lifestyle here. Amazing food scene. Yeah. Amazing wine scene. Um, the weather's great. Yeah. It's a, it's a really good place to be. So, so thinking about the future, as the world continues ev- to evolve, as we lean more on technology uh, to offset, you know, the challenges of being a restaurateur with labor and all that stuff. It doesn't sound like you're, you're feeling those, those pain points, though. A little dog fight going on outside. Uh-huh. <laughs> How are you evolving your business for the future? I guess for me, the net, the next step is where do we go from here? You know, we're, we're pretty much maxed out with the volume that we can do here. We, we can't really, you know, I could open up another day, but I don't want to open up another day. Yeah. Um, we could certainly bring in more revenue by doing that, but I really want. You're losing the balance. Right. right. And that's, that's something that's so important. Yeah. And. Um, so I think the next step is figuring out how we how we grow from here, and I think ultimately that's opening up a, a little concept where people can wait uh, for a table here, um, and then you know ultimately I want to do another concept in addition to that, another so a full, concept full that people can restaurant. wait for a table here. What, what do you mean by that? So as it is right now, if you came at say six th- six o'clock, yeah. And put your name down. They're going to tell you, all right, you can come back at 9.30 or 10 o'clock. Yeah. And so that's someone who, if they're co- if they're going to come back, they'll head to a bar somewhere else. Or they'll go grab a bite to eat somewhere else. And then they'll come back for their table. Got it. Um, so I want something that can really capitalize on that. So basically like a, another location, another concept that mm-hmm. you can send them to? Like that w- would that be a bar? It's something that would complement this. Yes, I'd love to do a, a little cocktail bar. Okay. Um, do you see? You mentioned earlier that you. Um, you said you couldn't bring this to a different city like Houston because you don't have the relationships there. I'm curious. Do you have a team of people who want to do what you're doing? Who you think could do what you do in different cities and establish those relationships? I think I think they could. Yeah, absolutely. I think if the right people, this this concept has legs. But you h- would hinge on the people, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it would be cool to see that you could provide opportunity for people who have the same desire of cooking like you cook, right? I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud at this point. No, absolutely. Um, so how do you how do you plan? So you want to? So it sounds like you want to open more concepts, right? I do. I yeah. mean, part part of part of me says what we have right now is so special. Yeah. And so unique. And so amazing. And I know in 20 years from now, I'm going to look back at what we're doing right now. And I'll be like, God, that was, that was incredible. Yeah. That, that was, that was the golden days. Yeah. Is there anything we did not touch on in your story that you think we missed a huge opportunity on a lesson or just a key part of your story? No, I think we, I think we did good. So peering into the future, we talked about your future, what you want to do. What about the industry, generally speaking? Is Are there elements of the industry that you just shake your head at? Uh, or the greater food system that you just shake your head at? And 
do you want to be a sounding board for anything going into the future? I think obviously our our industry is kind of dragging behind in terms of the progression side of things. Like what? Um, it's just not an industry that um, I don't know. I, f- I feel like we need to make it into an industry that people want to be a part of, that people really get gung ho about, that people want to be good people get excited about not as a it's not a last resort job it's a correct. i want to do this job correct so, so how do we do that um i think we need to make strides in terms of um pay equity when it comes to front of the house and back of the house um it's not an easy thing to do yeah but it's something that has to be done at some point um, but it's just you look at it on paper and you see what someone in the back of the house is getting paid versus someone in the front of the house and it's just not right how do we overcome that? I think it takes owners saying alright let's kind of split this a little bit yeah and um, so we had a the the CEO of uh, Fifth Street Group. I think they have a concept in there called Church something, um, and they're doing the Tip the Kitchen workshop, or they had this had this whole concept around Tip the Kitchen, where I think what they do is they give the guests the option, a line like on the ticket to Tip the Kitchen, and then whatever the ki- the, the kitchen gets tipped, they match. So I think I think just giving the consumer the option is one way to do it. Like we don't even give them the option, you know. Um, I know with the technology rearing up we're we're leaning less on servers and more on technology i think with that we can probably pull the tips probably easier i think there will be like like i don't know if we can do it i don't know the 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 localities around that right now and it's different per state but as the i think the front of house server transitions to more of like a floating general manager manager role right host role there's room to like pull those tips and to spread it out you know i think we're heading in that direction yeah i and i agree um, it does need to happen yeah. sooner rather yeah. than later. What about just like the food system in general? As somebody who is serving seafood, there's a lot of scary stuff out there right now with what's happening in the oceans. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's something that has to be constantly looked at and evaluated and, you know, what's, what's sustainable today um, is going to be different. Uh, a couple months from now yeah you know so it's something that has to be constantly managed and constantly reviewed and taken a look at um to make sure that 10 years from now we still can have a concept like chubby fish and people can still go down to their seafood shop and order something that that was locally caught right how do you feel about uh, fish farms um ultimately I think it's I think it's the future. Yeah. Um I don't think that um all fish farms are Created done well. <laughs> uh correct. Yeah, and I've heard some horror stories too. Right. I go and back I, and forth. And I've on also it. I've also gone out to fish farms that were amazing. Yeah. And uh you know, super clean and um you know, handle the runoff and uh, do really amazing stuff. Can want to give those farms a shout out? Sure. Uh, Sunburst Trout. Yeah. That's up in Asheville. Okay. Um, uh, Monterey Abalone out of Monterey Bay. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's 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 so many that are doing really good stuff, and you know, again, ultimately, we're going to be looking really intensely at fish farming you know in the next 25 years yeah as as the way forward right um anything this is the, the chance anything we did not get out that we want i think you already said we're good to go um actually one question i do have for you before we go to the speed round is who are you today versus the man you were when you got started in this industry how have you personally evolved um i become 
guess I've become less selfish. Um, God, what's the quote where it's great chefs are, or great cooks are selfish and great chefs are selfless, selfless, something along. I don't know. I don't know the quote. Um, so, you know, what I, what I am now is, you know, very much, I want to check in with, with my employees and I want to, um, see how they're doing Mm. and I want to see how, uh, we can, we can be better, um, you know, together. And so it's very much a team oriented, uh, situation. Whereas when I was coming along as a cook initially, it was very much blinders on head down and just bang it out, grind it out. Awesome. And, uh, now it's, now it's all about team. Chef James, I've loved this conversation. We're going to take one more quick break to thank our sponsors. We're going to bust out a speed round. We're back, and the first question I have for you is what is your it factor, a habit, a trait, a characteristic you believe most contributes to your success? Uh, I love my people. What is your biggest weakness? ADD, but it's also my greatest strength. Uh, what is one question you ask or thing you look for when you're growing your team, when you're interviewing people? Five-year plan. Five-year plan. And what are you looking for? They want to just know where they're going to be. Is there something that you, 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 you want to hear in their five-year plan? No, I just want to see what they're... If they have one? Yeah, what, <laughs> what, their, what their whole shtick is. Yeah. And are you looking to see if there's a way you can kind of get them there? or like, cool. Absolutely. I love that. What is your biggest challenge today? Expansion. How are you overcoming it? I'm doing it. Yeah. <laughs> Share one code of conduct or behavior you teach your team. A way to be, a way to, a way to act. Core value. Calmness under pressure. What is one uncommon standard of service you teach your team? So something that's common within the four walls of your restaurant to go above and beyond, but not common throughout the industry. We say goodbye to every guest who Ooh. leaves the restaurant. Why is that powerful? It shows people that you care. Mm. What is one book that's a must-read to make us a better person or restaurant owner? I've been reading the Rick Rubin book, um, The Creative Act. Biggest lesson from that book? Learning that creativity can come from anything, and you're constantly being been bombarded with uh, ideas. Yeah. So w- what do you do with that information? I don't know if I so creativity comes from everywhere and you're constantly being bombarded with ideas but what I, what are you what are you doing with that information I catch those ideas and spin them and throw them up on the menu Got it. so to being open to creativity and mm-hmm. ideas from anywhere I love that uh, what is one thing you feel restaurant tours don't do well enough or often enough one thing that I've started doing is I cook family meal mm. every day and it shows my employees that I care about them I love that. And what is one technology you've adopted recently that's had a huge impact on communication, efficiency, profitability, anything along those lines? Um, I love our point of sale system. What do you use? Solito. Solito. That's the first time I mentioned on the show. How'd you find it? Um, one of the investors in Nico. Okay. Um, this is his company. And okay. It's, it's a phenomenal. What uh, makes it point phenomenal? Of sale. It's so intuitive. It's it's an iPad base system um but it's it's set up so user friendly it's so adaptable and they're a really amazing company you can reach out to them 24 hours they they'll jump right on the program and fix whatever you want to fix that's huge customer support i think is underrated in the world of POSs. like weigh that into your decision making process it's huge and that's salido salido s-a-l-i-d-o Beautiful. First time mentioned on the show. Looking forward to diving deeper into that. And um, this is the last question. It's a, it's a doozy. Get ready for it. If you got the news, you'd be leaving this world tomorrow. All the memories of you, your work, and your restaurants would be lost with your departure, with the exception of three pieces of wisdom that you could leave behind for the good of humanity and your legacy. What would those three pieces of wisdom be? We'll go back to the original mantra, be like water. One. Um, the golden rule. Two. And... I guess I'll piggyback on the golden rule, and I said be nice to everyone. Three. I've loved this conversation, Chef James. Thank you so much, man, for taking the time to share your story, uh, to share your knowledge, and, man, um, just to, to be a shining example of just taking the risk and going for it and what you want and getting it, man, and just doing the work. Uh, there absolutely is no question you are unstoppable, but I almost forgot to ask you to call somebody out. Who do you respect and admire in the restaurant industry? Somebody that if you found out there were guests on the show, you would absolutely tune into that episode. She may be mad at me for 
throwing her into the spotlight, but Cynthia Wong, who does a company here called Life Raft Treats. Okay. And so she does these amazing, you may have seen these little fried chicken legs. Okay. That I haven't. Made out of ice cream. Oh. Um, but she does our, our dessert program for us. And, and that was uh, Alicia or Alyssa? Cynthia Wong. Cynthia, why did I get Alicia? Cynthia Wong. Yep, and All right. she has Life Raft Treats, and Life she, is, treats. she is the badass in town. She's okay. amazing. Cynthia, look out. I'd love to get you on the show. Um, and I guess this is where I say, you know, if we really were inspired by your story, if maybe we're passionate about seafood and cooking seafood and we want to come work for you to, to get a taste of what it is that you do, if that's something maybe we want to do, what's the best way to connect? Um, I would say either through Instagram or uh, on our web page, there's a link there. Beautiful. And I think this is episode 980. Head over to restaurantstoppable.com slash 980. We'll have a summary of today's discussion, as well as any links to tools or services mentioned today and how to connect with Chef James London. And I'll say it again, Chef James, there is no questioning, my man. You are unstoppable. Thank you. Thank you.